and welcome to the Fat Squirrel Speaks. Today is Wednesday, August something. I'm thinking 19th, but maybe 20th. It's the 20th. And this is episode 119, I'm pretty sure. Hi, how are you? I am Amy Beth, also known as your hostess, the Fat Squirrel. I think I said that in the wrong order, but you know, whatever, you can figure it out. Parse it, baby. Um, and that's the Fat Squirrel on Ravelry, or the Fat Squirrel, that's the Fat S-Q-R-R-L, on Instagram. Because somebody else was already the Fat Squirrel. I don't know who they are. <laughs> Clearly they're awesome. <clears throat> I apologize, I'm a little bit froggy today. Allergies! So exciting! We're having a bit of a heat wave at the end of our summer here. So I think things are like, pollinate! And everything just like released its pollen all at once. Like I hit a critical temperature and everything was like, oh my gosh, it's not forever! So our whole family is like, <laughs> super, super sexy. So today's episode will hopefully be a little bit on the shorter side. I know, I always say that and then it's like 80 minutes later. It's never my intention. So hopefully it'll be shorter. I don't have as much to show you this week, so that'll cut down on things. <laughs> um, this week's episode will contain no shenanigans. I know, right? What's up with that? But there will be... I'll save this shenanigans for the end. Okay, there were shenanigans. They're just not of the out and about variety. But I'll save those for the end. Um, before that, I will talk about knitting. No spinning this week. I know, right? Knitting and wool gorgery and shameless self-promotion and then we'll have shenanigans. Shenanigans are the apple butter and book variety so in case you're not interested I'll just say this for the end. Usually I just don't care if you're interested I'll just make you listen anyway. I will hold you hostage this time. You're welcome. Um, so spinning wise this week I don't have anything to show you because I'm still working on my sock fiber. Well it's really just it's made for socks. It's like 75% wool, 25% nylon from Leading Men Fiber Arts in the Popeye's Delight colorway. So I'm still working on that. It's about six ounces. So I'm just finished the fourth ounce. So hopefully I'll have it done next week. Um, but knitting, I have no finished objects. So I've been working a little bit on just about everything, but I'll just show you two things today because they're the ones that have the most significant progress. I'm still working on my sister bay, which is beautiful, um, but it looks very similar to what I did last time. So I'll try not to drag you through those that again. Sorry, I just have a burn on my arm and suddenly it itches horrifically. I have a waffle wire and burn. I feel like that should give me some sort of fat Girl Scout badge. Get a waffle iron burn, I'm just saying. Anyway. So the, what I will show you today is I'm still working on my, oh, I know I have two things, I can't remember what they're called. Let's, I think it's called the Bernadetta, but that seems like too many cons, that seems like too many syllables. So now I'm not sure. But anyway, it's by Cecily Bostic Hodge. It is the, oh no, it, there's no R, I lied. It's the Benedetta, like the Benedictine monks, monks. The Benedetta Cardigan by C Carrie Hostick Barge. Did I say Cecily? Bodge. Hodge. Oh my gosh! I would pretend it's the allergy medication, but I'm not actually on the Carrie Bostick Hodge. I'm pretty sure I said some of those things wrong. So it looks like that. It's a little garter stitch cardigan. Mine is knit with... Oh really, I should not be podcasting. Mine is knit with, they're in Maine, Bartlett Yarns in their sport weight that comes in a cone. They have both skeined and cone varieties, I do believe, if I'm not mistaken. Typically, if a company offers both a skein and a cone variety, the cone has more sizing or something in it, or it's less washed than the, the skein variety, because often it's intended for weavers, and I think they require more body in their yarn. I don't know that I'm totally making it up. Oh my gosh, thing, things I make up. Little R.Y. Crafty, I say little, she is little. Little R.Y. Crafty, she's so cute. Of the Knitting Go podcast. Knitting Go! I believe it's her episode 39. 
went to, she's a Canadian. Well, I guess I shouldn't say she's a Canadian. She lives in Canada, but I'm pretty sure she's a Canadian. She went to the um, mill where they process the fiber from Beaver Sly Dry Goods into yarn. So on her episode 39, towards the end-ish, you can see her go there. Ah, right. So this is why I said that. I make stuff up all the time. I guess I should, like, maybe I should just run a constant ticker. Like, nothing I say may be real. It may all be just made up. But I often say it with very, like, a lot of confidence. Because <laughs> that's how you do things, right? But sometimes I've just made it up. And I, sometimes I've said it with so much confidence over so many times that I no longer even realize that I've just made it up. Like, I have believe I am just living in my own reality. It's schizophrenia land in here about information, not people talking to me in my head. But anyway, <laughs> it is just schizophrenia land. I don't mean to, to mean schizophrenia. Sorry, let's move on before I get into a pit. But anyway, so I always just assume that the singles for Beaver Slide Dry Goods... Okay, back up. Yarn is made of singles, right? Like you... Usually. Sometimes it's just a single, but sometimes it's singles plied together, which is just a single strand of fiber, not plied. So I just always assumed the Beaver Slide had more knots than most yarns because, A, they have a really big skein. Like the sport yarn is like a 445 yard skein for sport yarn because it's very airy, so we get a lot of yardage. So it's merino, which is a shorter staple length, <clears throat> combined with mohair, but still. And, and, um, it's wool and spun, which means there's not a lot of twist in the single. The twist comes in in the plying. So I just always assumed that the breaks in the yarn, and they are always just ply, they, I don't, it seems like they're always just ply breaks, like one of the two plies has been knotted together. I always just assumed that happened because the ply would break because it wasn't that strong. Uh, but then when it's made into yarn, it's very strong. But then little Arway Crafty went there and she showed, she says the bobbins that they use, it's an old spinning mule. So it's, it's very old piece of equipment, like in excess of a hundred years old. But, um, I believe, see, I just made that up too. <laughs> I'm a liar. That's what this podcast should be called. I'm like a liar who knits. Excuse me. Um, but so she said the bobbins, and you can see the bobbins, are very small and actually do not hold that much yarn. So maybe really it's not because they're breaking, but just because the bobbins are so small that that happens all the time. Fascinating. Fascinating. Very interesting. So they're more si they're more similar to your like spinning wheel bobbins. They're not that small, I don't think, but they're in that neighborhood maybe. I'm just lying. I'm making stuff up. But maybe that's also why there are so many breaks in their yarn. Just saying. Right? Don't trust me. I'm a liar. <laughs> so anyway, that was fascinating. Okay, so what was I talking about? I was talking about my sweater, my Benedict sweater by Cecily Bostic Hodge. As I like to call her, CBH. I don't call her that. I don't call her anything. I don't know her. She's brilliant for sure. Um, but I'm knitting it with, okay, I already told you that. I don't think I told you the color last time. It's just deep gray, I believe, or deep sheep's gray, dark sheep's gray, something sheep's gray that is dark. So there it is. I just split for the arms, for the armhole. I just, you know, took out the armholes. So I'm right there. And even though this is really, this is knit on US 2s, I'm still really enjoying it. I'm, I'm sure I'll change my mind when I get like another four inches in. I'll be like, I'm done on these US 2s. But then I'll just change to US 3 and I'll make it more festive. <laughs> Get excited. That's how I do things. <laughs> but one of the exciting things about this sweater is once you're done, you're done. There's no finishing. Like you don't have to go in and put a button band on. You just do the buttonhole as you go. They're very tiny buttonholes meant for like a very small button. But so that's what it looks like so far. I did, the only thing I didn't, I don't think I told you this last week, I did put extra short rows in the back um, because I just prefer the way a sweater fits that way when it's a little bit, has more, a lot, most people do. I don't think a lot of pattern designers put them in because it's just like extra information and they can only put so much information in a pattern. Um, <clears throat> but I do typically like the way they fit better. So I add them in often. 
But so anyway, I'm just digging it. I love how the raglan increases look in the garter. I don't think I've ever done a garter stitch with a raglan increase, but I, I dig the way they look. They're very cute, and the little lace pattern looks sweet. And I love how sheepy it is. I dig it. I'm just going to wear overalls in the sweater all winter. FYI. Prepare. <laughs> So I think that's all I need to tell you about it. I'm doing my normal thing where I make a size, which is the Amy Herzog way. I make the size that's this size, and then I just make it bigger for the bust. The way I do that on a raglan is that I increase normally until about half of my armhole depth, and then I do double increases for the front, which means I increase every row, which is probably not ideal in terms of like, aesthetics in the sweater is laying flat, but I've never seen it to have any problem when it's on my body. Often, because again, when you start those, you're starting to go underneath your arm, so it's not as visible. And again, it just allows room for the boobalage. So I'm sure somebody will tell me that that's wrong, but I, I'm going with it because that's how I like it to work. I like how that fits. And it's also very easy, it requires very little thinking. I just start double increasing about halfway through, and then I just increase until I have enough stitches to cover the girls, and then it's done. And then I'll take those, and then I'll take those out in the underbust. So yay that! I also sometimes do a double increase towards the endish for my arms because I have proportionately larger arms um, for like shoulders. You know what I mean? Like my body doesn't say shoulders straight down; it says shoulders, combination of boobs and arms. It's that's the biggest part. So that's what I'm doing. So there's that. Um, and then the other thing I have to show you, I just started. Oh, I meant to look this up so I could be clever, but I thought I forgot. Shame on me. I got this yarn from Simply Sock Yarn. They now have the opal. Here we go. This is where I'm going to mess it up. Hoother Twasser. That's really not how you say it. But I enjoy the way that sounds. <laughs> it feels like it should be yelled at a bunch of marching people. Hoother Twasser. So that's an art. He's an artist. And so each one, each skein is inspired by an, a painting. And I may have bought way too many because I'm crazy. But the beautiful Susan B. Anderson, I believe I could, this is another thing I could be making up. But I believe she made one of the Hutterschwasser socks. <laughs> well, made a pair of them. And it was a colorway that had a lot of cream in it, which I also bought, or white, whatever you want to call it, ivory. And they were so awesome that I loved them ever, ever so much. So I just broke down and bought far too many skates. Whatever, I don't buy new shoes or handbags. Right? 100% into it. Love it, love it, love it. Well, again, this is one week's progress on a sock, which is unheard of for me. And it's already got a heel. I love this crazy yarn. I enjoy opal anyway, but this is a super crazy color combination and tech pattern, like, you know, color patterning option. I just dig them a lot. It seems like this specific um, variety of the opal has a lot of craziness going on, which I super enjoy. Right? And the ones that Susan did, or the ones I, in my head, Susan did, <laughs> had lots of, like, whites and greens and reds in them, so I'm going to maybe make them my super exciting Christmas song. Oh, and somebody asked me if these ones have sparkle. They don't have sparkle. They just have the sparkliness of color combination craziness. Like, look at this. I love this. Where is it? Okay, you can see better right there. And I am knitting these on double points, which I don't often do. Like, I love this stripe right here. And I also really love this yellow stripe right here. I love all the stripes. It's all crazy all the time. Um, Oh, and Simply Sock Yarn, they have beautiful faces, and feel free to support them if your local yarn store does not carry this opal, because they're awesome. And if you spend more than $85, which I'm sure you won't, because I would never, ha <laughs> ha lie, <laughs> then there's free shipping. I think it's $85. Come on! Do it! <laughs> anyway, and they have lots of other sock yarn, too. And by the way, they are not a paid sponsor. <laughs> they're just very cute. Um, 
<clears throat> what else do I say? I think that's all. Oh, so I'm knitting those on double points. I don't normally knit them on double points. Normally I knit socks on double zeros. When I do double points, I knit them on zeros because I have a tendency to have a slightly tighter gauge. It's not quite as tight as the double zero not, uh, magic looping effort for me, but it's if I knit them on double zeros, they're too tight. It's like a 72 stitch sock, 72 stitch sock, which is what I typically make for myself. <clears throat> was only it was way too narrow when I made it with double points into double zero. These are carbons. I didn't say that. I really like the carbons as double points in skinny in skinny gauges. Okay, that's all. Wool piggery. I got my first club shipment of anything ever, and it's beautiful. I guess I should have warned you. Sorry, it's new for me. This is from Spun Right Round, and this is colorway is called Dirty Bird. It's Rambouillet, which is one of my favorites. Isn't it gorgeous? I totally love it. I love it. I love it. The great thing about Renee is that she can do crazy brights, but then look at this. This is like all super neutral and gorgeous. Right? And yet has a little bit of a little bit blue. So pretty. I'm so excited. I'm so like, I should have gotten two club shipments. <laughs> I'm close. Anyway. So, okay, so now we'll do shameless self-promotion. So very briefly, this week, August 22nd, there will be a shop update, and it's primarily sock bags. Um, okay, so I'll show you two. They all have birds on them. I wasn't kidding. So this is the first one. This is a this slight this print is slightly more variable. It's a larger print, so you will not have this exact placement. But everybody should at least have a whole bird. And then the lining is just like the flower cord bit. I know right? it's pretty. It's still bright and nice in there. So yeah, that. there's that one. And then these three are all a family. So here we go. Right. I love this silly print so much. It's crazy. It's very, again, somebody, I said they're like little folksy birds. Somebody said they look very Pennsylvania Dutch. I agree. It's Pennsylvania Dutch colors. Super cute. And these all have this lining. The next three I'm showing you. And it's like a little bright yellow with a butterfly thing going on. I love it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. So there's this one. And there's this one, which is the same print, essentially, just in a different colorway. So there's these two. Now these two will also be made available in a large wedge in a very limited quantity. So if you really want the large wedge out of these two, you may want to try to get to the update quickly. It's at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Maybe not, I don't know, but there are fewer of those by far. And then this is the third one, which secretly I didn't like as much as the other ones, but now I secretly love more. Don't tell them you're my favorite. I don't know what I think I love it. I love gray, so maybe that's it, but so right, and this guy will only be available in a sock size. Aren't they cute? And again, they all have the yellow. So I've enjoyed sewing these little guys this week. It's been so fun. So yay, my job! Yay! I had a total nightmare the other night. We went to Toba's like open housey thing, and I had a nightmare that I had become a teacher again. <laughs> Bless your heart, teachers. It was the worst night. It was not the worst nightmare, but it was a very uncomfortable nightmare. It was not pleasant. And the whole time I kept thinking, why did I take this job? I had a job where I worked from home. Why did I take this job? <laughs> oh, this is terrible. <laughs> okay, so the last little bit is all silliness that has nothing to do with yarn. So if you don't want to stick around, I'll tell you next time. If you do want to stick around, oh my gosh, shenanigans, apple butter. I had apple buttery shenanigans. Why is apple butter not on My Little Pony? I guess Apple Jack is, but I'm just saying. She would be like the luscious, voluptuous pony. Like the old school ponies with haunches. Call her apple butter. Anyway. <laughs> I made apple butter. So last week I was talking to you about making apple butter. My, I was thinking about making apple butter. And I was talking about how I was, I, 
I love to over research things. Some things, apparently not all. Sometimes I just make up opinions and go with it, or go with theories and just go with them. But I do enjoy over researching to the point of paralysis where you can't do anything because there's too many theories on how to do it. I love that. That's fun. But apple butter. So I was really kind of like, most of the um, recipes that are currently available involve a crock pot. I have a crock pot. Um, it does not, the lid doesn't have a handle anymore, broke off a million years ago. But whatever, it's still a viable and working crock pot. So I have one, but I had all of these like terrible suspicions. Like I would read reviews of the episode, of the episode, of the recipe, and they would say things like, I read the Martha Stewart one, for example. And they kept talking about how their, their applesauce was very runny. And like, I would see pictures of the, of the apples, apple butter, excuse me. My apologies. And they were talking about how runny it was. And then like they kept, I kept seeing pictures of apple butter that did not look like apple butter to me. It looked like applesauce, like in terms of its coloration. So I was very concerned that the crock pot perhaps would not provide for browning. So what I did was the first day of the apple butter adventure, <clears throat> excuse me, I did it on the stove, the stove oven combination. So basically I have one cookbook that's called More With Less, which is like a Mennonite cookbook, which I really love. <laughs> I'm such a nerd. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited you're enjoying all the farm programs. Okay, anyway, back to this. Um, oh, speaking of farm programs, very quickly, there's also Outback House, I've been informed, and that is available on Hulu Plus and perhaps clips on YouTube, but I haven't researched that yet. So there's also that one, Outback House. From what I understand, it's more in the vein of our American, like Frontier House, Ranch House, those ones, but just FYI, it's out there. Anyway, so first day I made it, the, oh, so my Less With More cookbook says, make applesauce and put it in the oven for three hours. And I was like, right on. <laughs> Sounds good to me. So then there are also camps that say, peel the apples and core them. And there's another camp that says, just take out the stem. Well, which of these two sounds infinitely easier? Take out the stem. Now, if you do just take out the stems, you do need to have access to a food mill, which I do have. Um, or you have to be insanely patient and like strain it, which ugh, don't even, just don't try, don't do that, it's crazy. No. Um, <clears throat> a food mill is just like a little bowl that has like discs in it that are of different sizes and then you like rotate this thing and it smushes the food through them. It's basically like a mechanically assisted strainer thing. They're very good for making mashed potatoes and applesauce. But if you just take out the core, what allows that to happen is apples have a lot of pectin in them. And in fact, olden, olden time recipes actually had you, I believe, using the peels and cores, render down pectin to add to your fruit jams and things to gel them up a little bit. I, I believe that is true. So I thought, oh, that sounds right. And also sounds very homey to leave it all together almost, right? Use every bit. So that's what I did. I just took out the stems. So I cut out the top stem and I cut out the butt stem and then threw them in a pot. Now I eventually did have to cut some of them in half just to get them all to fit in the pot because I'm crazy. And most recipes, recipes that require five pounds, I was like, ah, if you're gonna do it, if you're gonna get the dishes dirty, do it up. So my first recipe, I did 10 pounds. So I have like a, an enameled cast iron pan, and that's what I used, because it easily goes from stove to oven. So I cooked my 10 pounds of apples. I put just a tiny bit of water in them to help because once the apples start to cook, they'll release a lot of liquids and you don't want to have to take all that off at the end. You don't have to try to boil that down at the end. <clears throat> wow, this is taking a lot longer than I thought it would. Sorry. <laughs> Whatever. So I just put a little bit of water in the bottom of the pan, put it on the stove on like medium-ish, secretly medium-high because my stove does not do medium or less any very well. It's gas. And just let those cook down. Just apples and a tiny bit of water. Okay, so then they cooked down, they got all smooshy. At that point, I ran them through the food mill. Now the first set that I did, I did on the medium setting. And I think ultimately that was the most successful, but we'll talk about that in a minute. I ran them through on the medium setting and it was amazing how little waste there was. It was awesome. I think 
really the food, the peel of the apple even just completely just dissolve, it just butters it up. Because really what came out of the food mill at the end was maybe a cup of waste from 10 pounds of apples with cores and everything. By the way, if you're worried about arsenic in the apple seeds, don't, it's not enough to hurt you. Okay, if you're afraid, but don't worry, it's okay. Maybe like a cup and what was left over was very obviously like, you know, when you cut an apple to, to take the core out and like the core is almost like a wiry, I mean, it's not wiry, but it has that very abrasive, like stringy feel to it. That was really what was left. It was like these little glassine strands in there. It was fun. <gasps> Fly! Bastard. Anyway. Oh, so it's really cool. I think the peels really just do cook down or get soft enough to go through the food mill and like it's so exciting. Right? How cool is that? So at that point, I added my sugar and my cinnamon and my cloves and my nutmeg. Okay, now those proportions I'm not even gonna, t well, I'll tell you my sugar proportion, but the other thing is you just gotta do it to taste. Like whatever is up to you. Sugar you have to do to taste too, because most recipes for five pounds of apples will have you put in four cups of sugar. What is that? That's insane. I would like my apple butter to taste like apple-y butteriness, not sugar sugarness. So for 10 pounds of apples, I put in one cup of sugar, brown sugar. So sugar to taste. Unlike jelly, where sugar plays a vital role in the texture of the final product, sugar has nothing or very little to do with the texture of the final apple butter product. One cup of, just start with one cup or half a cup to five pounds and then up it up as you want to. But ultimately, I think my proportion was awesome. Now, I used half Ida Reds and half, excuse me, half Paula Reds. I knew that wasn't right. Paula, half Paula Reds and half a Connie's. And the Paula Reds are very specifically like good for saucing apple they break down very easily the Akanis or a Jonathan they don't break down as easily but you're cooking this stuff so long really it does not matter <laughs> how long did I cook it I have no idea until it was mushy so then I ran it through the food meal added the sugar and the spices and then I put it back in the same um, enamel pan and put it in the oven I put mine in at 350 I believe maybe 375 again just do it till it feels right and then no, no lid and then I just let it cook down until it was the right consistency, which is approximately three hours, depending on your apple and how long you cooked it down when it was sauce, et cetera, et cetera. The only, re I just did it till it felt right. I did do that whole traditional thing where you take a spoon of it and then like a spoon of apple butter and then make a path through it to see if it caves in on itself. And it didn't do that. So I figured that test plus my intuition about the texture was good. So then I just canned it, hot water bath. So that was very successful. So the next day I was like, I'm doing it. I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it for the viewers. I was very satisfied with my op my thing I did. But the next day I did the same process except I did it in the crock pot. And I did it with five pounds of apples. So I did five pounds of apples in the crock pot with the tiniest bit of water. Cause in the crock pot, you know, I was worried about it actually sticking or burning um, as you are with it on the stove. So again, tiny bit of water, let it cook down, run through the food mill, add half a cup of sugar, brown sugar, cinnamons, whatever you want. I don't think I had cloves because I was out of them at that point. <laughs> I didn't have an extra amount of cloves. I had whole cloves, but I was not doing a bouquet gardening. I was like, <laughs> this would be crazy. So, <sighs> the only other difference is I got afraid and ran it through on the finest thing on the food mill. Because I, the texture of, I liked the texture, but then when I put it in the cans, you can kind of see the jars, whatever. You can see a little variation, like a little bit of, but really in reality, while well, you can see that you don't feel it in your mouth. It has no mouth feel. So I don't, I don't think it matters really. Medium or fine, whatever. There was a similar amount of waste. It took a little bit longer on the fine because you have to, it just takes longer. This is a finer mesh. Ultimately though, look at that. They're almost, this is the one in the crock pot. It's a little jar is crock pot, big jar is stove. They are almost the same color. The crock pot is marginally, I mean, 
really marginally lighter. It might just be because the glass is thicker. I mean, I don't know. But it's almost imperceptibly different. The taste of the cooked one versus, um, of the stove one versus the crock pot. The stove one, oh, by the way, also recipes require to add apple juice. I think that's because they required five cups of sugar somewhere. I did not add apple juice. It tasted bright and beautiful. I mean, lemon juice, sorry. Citricusness. Um, the one that it cooked on the stove, again, you could, I think you could only tell in a side-by-side -side comparison is marginally brighter tasting. It has marginally a higher flavor note in there somewhere. But I secretly think it might be because I ran it through a, a larger setting on the food mill. I, I don't know why I think that, but in my head I think, oh, I damaged the cells more when I ran it through the finer sieve than the larger one. I, I'm just making that up. But again, this is like my whole American Test Kitchen. I love America's Test Kitchen the cook series but sometimes a side by side yes you can tell a difference when they're side by side but you really can't tell a difference if they're not so sometimes I don't need to brown the butter for my chocolate chip cookie because really when I taste it next to the one that's not brown yes I can tell a difference but when I taste them two months apart I can't tell a difference so it's kind of like that kind of minutia side by side you can tell a difference I would say both both options are completely viable though. Especially if it's hot and you don't want to heat up your house with an oven. Crock pot's fine. You can make more if you do it in the oven. But that's maybe not everybody needs to make. 20 pounds of applesauce at a time. I don't know, I'm just saying. Apple butter, whatever. So that's how I feel. They're both completely viable. Don't put too much sugar in it though. Come on. Really, you don't need that much sugar. The fat lady tells you you do not need much sugar. You don't need that much sugar. If I was like a tiny little athletic woman, you might be like, mm-hmm, because that's what I would think. But I'm telling you, you don't need that much sugar. You don't need that much sugar. Okay. See, now we're on 32 minutes. Very briefly, I will just tell you, I got this book from the library, Farm Anatomy. The Curious Parts and Pieces of Country Life. This book is really cute. I don't know that I would ever buy this book, because it is not very informative per se. However, it is really beautiful. Like, look, here's the different, like, here's a picture of all the different squashes. But it doesn't like go into de like detail about why the patty pan is different than the saffron, which is different from the Jack B. Little. Do you know what I mean? It's really just eye candy. It's, it's a pretty book though. And the illustrations are all very similar and there is a sheepy section. So drawings of six breeds of sheep. It gives you a little bit of information in this case, but not excessive amounts. It does give you different sheep terms, different parts of the sheep. So it gives you the different ha. I mean, really, I have enjoyed looking at this book so much. It's very good for like time you would normally just be looking at stupid stuff on your phone. Instead, you can look at stupid stuff in a book, but it's prettier. <laughs> There's all the different goat, well, not all the different, but like all the goats. It's really, I'm trying to get to the, the, the chicken part, the cows. Okay, so, oh, here are all the different, well, not all the different, but again, a variety of heritage turkey breeds. It's just really pretty to look at. I'm focusing more on the animals because I'm crazy. But look, this is what's fun. Comb styles. It outlines the different comb styles. Don't you just want like this portrait of a chicken in your house? Like in an oval gilded frame, right? So I don't know that I will buy this book, but I might because it's very pretty. There's an apple section about different varieties of apples, but no information about like why they're different. <laughs> So again, it's very pretty. It's not information laden. It's really almost like a, a, a too advanced children's book. Do you know what I mean? But it's still enjoyable. So if you have it, if you have it through your library, again, it's called Farm Anatomy, The Curious Parts and Pieces of Country Life. It's by Julia Rotham. If you have it at your local library, I would suggest checking it out because it's pretty cool. And, oh, and there's even a very brief section on spinning a yarn. Chapter 7 is called Spinning a Yarn. And it talks about making yarn. It talks about dye colors. 
But again, not information, it's prettiness. <laughs> so anyway, that's it for this week. I hope you have a lovely week in your future. And I'll talk next time. Bye.